Welcome to Revolutionize Your Retirement Radio, bringing you insights and strategies to help you create a magnificent and fulfilling second half of life. Here's your host, certified professional retirement coach and best-selling author, Dr. Dorian Mincer. Connie Goldman was born in 1931 and passed away on March 8, 2022, a week after a diagnosis of stomach cancer interview that you're about to listen to took place in September 2016, when she was almost 85 years old. Since then, in 2018, she added two additional books, The Gifts of Caregiving and Wisdom from Those in Care, Conversations, Insights, and Inspiration. Connie was a dear friend, colleague, and role model for so many of us. When I re-listened to the interview, I felt the joy of hearing her talk, but also miss her and the opportunity for more conversations. This interview is a tribute to Connie, commemorating her life and the gift she has given to all who have known her in person, through her speaking, and through her writings. In my interview with Connie, she told some wonderful stories about herself and others. At one point, she commented on a memorial service for a dear friend of hers. She commented about how so many people spoke about her friend as a gift, and she said, what a wonderful thing to be remembered that way, as a gift in so many different ways to so many people. It is a wonderful way to be remembered, and it's how Connie is and will be remembered. Connie was a wonderful person and a gift for so many of us with her wisdom, wit, and honesty. She talked about getting real dealing with the challenges and the losses, and finding ways to accommodate to the changes and the opportunities of aging. Her memory is a blessing. I hope those of you who knew Connie will enjoy this interview. And for those who aren't yet aware of her and her writings, I encourage you to learn more about Connie and her contributions to the field of aging. Thank you, Connie, for being such a pioneer and wonderful person. I want to welcome everybody to my fourth Tuesday Revolutionize Your Retirement interview with Expert Series. I'm Dori Mincer, your host and facilitator and owner of Revolutionize Retirement. So without further ado, I want to introduce you to this wonderful woman who's with us today, Connie Goldman. I've actually met Connie back in, I think, 2007, and it's just been so nice on and off over the years to be able to see her in person. And I always just And watch me age. (laughs) Well, we all age, but yes, watch you age and watch me age, and you're one of my role models. And, uh, And I'm just really delighted that you're with us today. Let me tell you a little about Connie, and then we'll begin. So Connie was formerly on the staff of National Public Radio, NPR, and she is an award-winning radio producer and reporter. For more than 35 years, her public radio programs, books, and speaking have been exclusively concerned with the changes and challenges of aging and family caregiving. She's grounded in the art of personal stories collected from hundreds of interviews, and her presentations are designed to inform, empower, and inspire. Her message on public radio in print and in person is clear. Make any time of your life an opportunity for new learning, exploring, creative pursuits, self-discovery, spiritual deepening, and continued growth. She's got many books. I'm just going to mention the titles of them. The Age of the Spirit, Secrets of Becoming a Late Bloomer, The Gifts of Caregiving, Stories of Hardship, Hope, and Healing, Late Life Love, Romance, and New Relationships in Late Years, Tending to the Earth, Mending the Spirit, The Healing Gifts of Gardening, and Who Am I Now That I'm Not Who I Was, Conversations with Women in Midlife and Beyond. Connie's just this wonderful, wonderful woman with 85 years of life experience, and today we're going to be reflecting on life, on partnerships, and the adjustments in later life. So, Connie, I am just so delighted to have you here and to you know, well, to share you with all these people. <laughs> that certainly was an introduction by the president of my fan club. <laughs> I'll tell you that. <laughs> well, well, I am. The I mean, of your fan club. But so. thank you for that. I think it was 
kind of a little bit overdone, but that's all right. Well, I know how to okay. accept the compliment. <laughs> I mean, you really are a role model for all of us because, you know, during your 85 years, you've both done so much and, you know, had to kind of deal with kind of the losses, the changes, the adjustments that we all need to make as we age. And Well, you um, know, you can, you can do more than just deal with them. You can learn something about yourself and you can learn from them too. Can you share Those a little challenges about Challenges and changes. Right. Do you want to share a little of, well, I mean, we could start with, I mean, there's so many w- wonderful things that we've talked about wanting to talk about well, together. And you know, the challenges and, aid, uh, and the changes that we, that we choose. I mean, very often you can't. I mean, you're in an automobile accident or some, you fall down your steps. You, you have to deal with the results of whatever that accident or whatever that happening or whatever disease comes your way by not by invitation and how you deal with it and how you deal with your attitude towards it and how you keep your focus on staying alive. I mean, live, focusing on living is what I mean. Mm-hmm. Focusing on what you have, even though you're without some of the things that you did have, whether it's good health or the independence of activity or I guess that what I'm really saying is there's all kinds of ways to either accept to accept and live with the challenges and changes and how you deal with them and what you do about them. The steps along the way on where the rest of your life goes. To be more specific, I mean, if we all have changes and losses. We look at them as losses. I mean, if you look at them as just changes or the inability to do this that way, now I'll do it this way, then how you deal with it is in your hands. You don't have to look at everything as as a loss. You can look at it as a necessary change. And then you can find a way to live with that change, adapt to it, integrate it into your life, and not let it be a, a negative Totally. I don't and you know. and I had talked. That kind of yeah. generalization says it very well. No, but I think it does. And because you and I were talking about sort of the accommodations that we need to make as we get older, as their changes, and 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 you know, in in a big way, also in relationships. And since we sort of had said we were going to talk about sort of partnerships in late life and relationships, and it you know it can be with a you know, a significant other, it can be with our adult children, it can be with grandchildren, it can be with whomever. But but the, the, the point that I love that you make is that if we just focus on the loss, then it can it can become a downhill spiral. And that's not to say there aren't a lot of losses and that that is For needing sure. to do that's but true. but it's but it's needing to figure out and learn ways to kind of accommodate and alter our attitudes and expectations as we age. Yeah. Well, it's everything that many people think of as a loss can also be looked at as a necessary change. And if you look at it and define it as a necessary change that is your challenge, then there are other ways to deal with it. Like when I go out walking, and I'm lucky I can still go out walking every day. Everybody walks by me. <laughs> Why? <laughs> because I don't walk very fast anymore. And so many people would think, well, if you don't walk fast, it's not exercise. But I'll tell you something. It is exercise. If you move your body, your arms are moving back and forth, your legs are moving. It's how you keep an old body 
moving at its pace that it's able to move. It uh, It's worth the challenge because the more we are able to hang on to the movements of our bodies and the thoughts that we have, and even if they only last a few minutes, I mean, uh, some of us are really are dealing in the later years with short-term forgetting. And there are all kinds of ways to help that along. But, you know, a loss is a loss. And an accommodation sometimes is only a partial way of dealing with how you live with that loss or accommodate what you have left. Mm -hmm. So how do you, you agree? Do I, I I do, and I, you know, and I know so much of your work. I was going to say, how do you do it? But but I want to kind of bring in just how important stories are of your own stories as well as the stories from other people, and that I, I know you've shared with me that you believe that inspiration and learning is available through the sharing of personal stories of this adjustment and growth. And I think you've just given one example of you know being able to focus on you know how important it is to still walk even if you're the slowest person around and i must say i just came back from the national center of creative aging conference and there was so much focus on just movement and movement stimulates the brain and how important it is and i did a whole bunch of different breakout sessions on moving and dancing oh it was so wonderful and it's so important to do so well, you know, um, some of us live in a climate where if we're going to move in the winter, you, you can only may, maybe get out your front door to pick up your newspaper as far as the outsides go. Mm-hmm. But if you find a way to mm-hmm. keep your body moving, uh, you know, in my neighborhood, because sometimes we have pretty vicious winters here in the Midwest, in my neighborhood, very often in the mid middle of the day, you'll see people that I can tell are close to my stage of life walking around supermarkets without a shopping cart and without shopping, just walking because the temperature is right in the supermarket. And if you walk up and down the aisles two, three maybe four times, and and you don't stop to look and see what's on sale. But if you really move, I mean, it may not be as interesting as when the leaves are changing in the fall and you can take a different kind of walk outside. But, you know, it makes a difference that you're even driving over to the supermarket, walking around twice in that direction, twice in the other direction and you and you actually can stay out of other people's way and keep a decent pace moving whatever your pace is i mean mine is much slower than it used to be but i keep moving and i think oh, here i am taking my walk in a supermarket but you know what I feel better for the rest of the day for having made those leg movements. And it makes a difference just to keep moving. Sometimes I think, oh, I have to go back upstairs. I forgot to get X, Y, Z. But you know what? If you hang on to the railing and you walk up and down the stairs four extra times during the day, you can really look at it as exercise, too. No, it is. Know. It might be a naive sort of approach, but it is movement. Mm-hmm. And movement keeps movement going. And the other part that you're saying, and I know a story that you had told me about going later to your exercise program, you know, where you connected with some people you hadn't seen for a while. And mm-hmm. so movement right. and being out also can 
keep up relationships and friendships. And I wonder if you could speak to that because, you know, just the importance well, of yeah. partnerships now, and connections. If yeah. The pool at my local YMCA is it's an Olympic-sized swimming pool, and it opens at 5 in the morning. And if I am up and ready to leave the house at 5.15 or whatever, and I drive over there, I know that you are going to doubt what I'm going to be saying, but I have trouble finding a parking space, and there's plenty of room there, but it's filled. There are many people there, and here's here's the dividing line. Many of them are 75, 80, 85 years old. Many of them are trying to get their exercise in before they go to work. They're younger people. So there's that mixture, and you walk in, and if you're elderly, if you're old, if you're close to 85 like I am, there's all these young people that say good morning to you. It's it, it's very important. Sounds like a little thing, but we're important to them and they're important to us. And even though I don't know their names, some of them, the people that get in the swimming pool in the slow lane in the morning, some of them <laughs> well, there's a handful of us, and they're between the ages of, often between the ages of 40 and 85. And there we are, in the freedom of the, of the water, which means that even an old body can move well. And it's, it's it's like a it's a great way to start the day because it's a real way to be out in the world. Mm-hmm. And if you're lucky enough to have a pool close, I'm four minutes away. And if you aren't, then you readjust your day so that you can go at two in the afternoon to wherever it is that you can exercise. And you know, you can even go to a shopping center and walk briskly through it twice and then promise yourself you can go through it once slowly and do a little shopping. And there are ways to get activity, physical activity, into your life that keep your body going. It's it's not a good excuse to say, oh, gee, it's cold out. I'm going to have to skip exercise today. Because if you do that all winter long, moving, if you if you got an old body or even a younger one, you aren't going to move as well in the spring. I mean, it's it's a routine you have to design for yourself and work out what works for you. I mean, there aren't any particular classes that you should take. Depends on what appeals to you or who else might be in the class that can encourage you. You know, it's all an individual thing. But making a choice to keep your body and your mind active and pursuing something that offers it to both your mind and your body. You can try a couple of things, and if they don't work or if they're boring to you or if they're inconvenient for you, then you can pick something else. I'm I'm telling you, the, the most boring thing is to walk, to know that you can't do anything outside because it's so darn cold or raining or windy or whatever. And if you go in the supermarket and you just say, the fourth time around, I'll do the shopping. 
But three times, I'm going to walk up and down those aisles and just exercise. Walk by everybody. And I'm not going to be distracted by 10% sale today. <laughs> well, it helps also offset lo- loneliness, you know, too, to just get out and about and and smile and, you know, at people and have people smile back at you. or to, Yeah, a lot of people, people say yeah. good morning to you. Right. I, I right. know... It it nourishes you in a mm-hmm. in a way that you don't even understand. It, you, you're part of the human race, you know. Mm-hmm. Good morning, we we say to one another yeah. as we get out of our cars at the same time. And maybe it's and helpful have... for people to recognize too of how important it is to make eye contact and smile at people, you know, when we're out and about. I mean, yes. you know, I mean, I, mean, I know we live in a world where you have to sort of judge, you know, that you don't want to have it's eye contact. It's interesting, though, when if you it's smile, a, even, if it's, right. even if you have that look on your face that's right. not depressed and withdrawn, people smile back at you. Mm-hmm. It, it evokes a similar response right. in in most people that are walking by you. And in some strange way, it kind of nurtures you. Mm-hmm. You don't have to analyze it. Right. Just experience it. Mm-hmm. I mean, I know I was at the Y very early this morning. And I only saw two people I know by name. But I smiled at a lot more. And a lot of younger people are there because they have to get, you know, in and out of what they're doing and get dressed and go to work. And a lot of older people have been up since 4.30 in the morning. And so they're they're ready for a few smiles. Right. <laughs> Life changes, you know. Every right. Every day we have to listen to the changes of our body and our life and the changes in the weather and how it affects the choices we make. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Aging is full of a lot of changes, some planned Mm -hmm. and mostly things that come into your life that make you make choices on how you're going to react and, and integrate them into your life. Which which it sounds like makes the difference often between the term kind of resilience or, you know, feeling overwhelmed with some of those changes, like losses she of a partner. She said there were going to be some people asking some questions. Where are they? I'm waiting. I'm waiting. But I'm going to ask some questions, too. Oh, okay. Um, but I, I wanted you, I mean, I was just commenting on what you were saying before, but, but I know that you often say facts illustrate, but stories illuminate. Can you sort of expand on that, of sort of how you develop that perspective and maybe well, share a little of the, some of the stories about kind of late life partnerships and adjustments? Well, I guess that I grew up on, <laughs> I grew up without any siblings around. And so the people that I got to know and the experience that they had were in stories my parents read to me or that when I was able to read my own, it was those people's experiences that introduced me to the world out there. Mm-hmm. And I, uh, somehow or other, I mean, sure, there are lessons to be learned in this world. I mean, basic ones like safety and all the rest of the things that are important to keep our lives going. But what can we learn from another person's story? I I found that out very young because I didn't have a lot of people around me. And when I would read a story, even if the story was about someone from of a different age or a different stage of life and a whole different experience, not 
not like my life at all, or probably life like my life would never be. I might be able to learn something about the attitude they had on how they resolved a challenge that came up in their life or a problem that was presented to them by a situation in their life. And, you know, you never know what you're going to learn from someone (laughs) who might be a fictitious character, not even a real person. On the strength of character that they exhibited in how they made a choice in their life or why they decided to do this instead of that and how they weighed the circumstances to make that choice. I mean, it's how, it's how I learned to deal with the world out there because I didn't have a lot of contemporaries in my life. And I can see that people tell me very often when they read some of the stories that I offer in my several books or or in some of the talks I give, I'll get I'll get notes or emails far into the future and tell me how this particular story and this particular one of my six books you know, or how that affected a decision they made. It it validates for me that in a whole different situation in life, a person living a totally different life can go through the reasons in in their conversation, in their conversation that I edit and present in a readable form in in my books or I, I have in my previous radio programs, how they learn from that person, from how they summon their inner strength to deal with their situation. Now, your situation can be totally different, but what might be the lesson there is how they deal, how they dug for that inner strength and found what they didn't know they had to deal with the challenge that was presented in their lives. We can really learn a great deal from how other people may have handled their experiences in their life, and I really continue to believe that. And now I see that. As I'm looking at aging with my contemporaries and and in many of the things I write and uh, and offer, I mean I'm I'm not in the middle of writing another book right now, but I have written articles. If somebody will make a remark to me, and it, if I'll say to myself, "Oh, I hope I can remember that by the time I get home," because it's a wonderful title for an article. I keep I can't take paper and pencil into the swimming pool with me in the morning at the Y, but I keep it right in the car. And now I've learned because my memory is even shorter. Now I've learned to carry it into my locker so that once I get out of the pool if I can just get over to my locker and write down something that someone said to me that stimulated a thought that got me thinking. It's, so I have a couple of questions. I, now I can start integrating. I mean, I have more of my own, but from the audience too, which I think fit right into what you're saying. And Marsha from Brookline, Massachusetts, wonders if you could share a specific story of aging that you hold really dear to yourself. A specific story about aging? Well, just one of the, your stories, not about aging, but one of your stories from your books or your radio probably so one one of your stories that you hold really dear that well um, you know I, I what comes to mind immediately will make you think that i'm quoting it because they're well known personalities and that isn't true only one of my books de- has dealt with movie stars and actors and i remember jessica tandy and hume cronin mm-hmm. on how they 
through the humor back and forth with each other, I recorded a couple of different conversations with them. And this, they were talking about very serious things, about disabilities, about deaths of friends. And yet they were able to go through sadness and recall the loss and recall the lightness in the relationship and the gift of how that friendship was. I've spent mm-hmm. just this in my personal life, I've spent this weekend, this past weekend, at a memorial service and a more memorial event. It wasn't a, a, like a service. It was a whole day event to, condemner, to commemorate the loss of someone that was well known in many different ways as a personal friend, as a parent, as a teacher, as a social activist, many different identities. And the whole day was full of different episodes shared around food and conversation and it was a choreographed day all about commemorating this life and what it gave to each of us which is different you know what it, what what it meant it meant a great deal of difference to someone in the family and each member of the family or friends and i had been friends for 50 years with this person and in 50 years we had shared many different experiences and our own growth and changes it's you never know in some of the stories that were we shared with each other during this day long event that was interspersed with meals and conversation and sharing. You never know what story you're going to hear about what this person shared in his life. That you wake up the next morning and you think, what a gift, what a gift. And to leave this planet and have left the gift of your life with others is an amazing accomplishment. And there was a whole day, a whole day on Saturday for so many of us. Mm -hmm. And what this person had shared with us, because we're all a different part of it, we all were a different part of his life. It it's really ends up being a personal gift. I guess I guess what's really true is that every life that passes through this world has many gifts to offer to different people and they're different gifts and their memories that you keep and their examples that you live by. It's, yes, if if a person's gone, I mean, life has a cycle. (laughs) It's, there's, no one's ever gotten out of here alive. (laughs) But who they were and what they offered in a relationship with that person or by example, that can be the gift that they leave you. And I've just had a whole weekend Mm -hmm. of that in my life with a very close old friend that I knew for 50 years and having spent this whole day of celebration that was organized by his family, I learned what he was able to offer to other people. It it was a very illuminating day to see aspects of this person that, that, we're not, in my experience, 
but in someone else's and taught me a lot about what I didn't know about him in spite of knowing him for 50 years. It's a beautiful example of the, no, it's a beautiful example of the kind of thinking about living our legacy and the legacy that, you know, just a part of our legacy is the way we touch people. And, and it's so often at memorial services that that's shared and it's so lovely if it can be shared with people. Well, what was so lovely about this is it was a whole day long. Right. So, yeah. And, yeah. and as different and it was choreographed mm-hmm. amazingly well. Mm-hmm. So that food was offered at just the right times mm-hmm. and respite mm-hmm. and, mm-hmm. and movement. Mm-hmm. So that and we had to get up and go in the other room, and and so we weren't just sitting there for four hours in a row. Right. But it it opened the door to all kinds of points of view from mm-hmm. different people who knew this person in a different way. Mm-hmm. It it really was a beautiful event. Mm-hmm. I was I was very impressed that how open people were Mm -hmm. with their feelings. There were a lot of sharing their stories. Yeah. Yeah, And I mean, a couple of people were crying as they told their story Mm -hmm. because Mm -hmm. it was such a deep experience for them. And many used the term gift. Mm -hmm. Oh, this person was such a gift in my life. I mean, what a wonderful thing to be remembered like that. Don't you agree? I agree, and I want to integrate some of the other questions and comments from people made on the call, Meg from, Meg from Weston, Meg Newhouse, who specializes in legacy, says, given that I often look through a legacy lens, this memorial event was all about a beautiful multifaceted legacy. And what you are talking about with how to reframe and adapt to the challenges and losses of aging is to leave a very positive legacy about how to age gracefully and well. So she's really making a comment of just the gift you're giving us today. In terms of, you know, sometimes gracefully, aging gracefully and well, come out of experiences that that person has endured or experienced, Mm -hmm. because they can be both endured or experienced. And because of their attitude towards the losses, or the learning, that's the gift that they may leave you. Talking about how, if a person talks about how they deal with the loss in their life, the loss of parts of their body, or the use of part of their body, or the loss of contacts because you can't drive anymore, or the loss of people because so many, you've outlived so many of your friends, whatever. I mean, there are losses as as we age and changes and limitations very often. And to not dwell totally on the aspect of loss but the gift that was left you or the gifts that you still have in your life, it, it's, it makes a difference in looking at a day that can have some pluses in it. I remember one couple that I interviewed, how they told me they were caregivers for three people in their family at one time. And they would come home from one hospital visit to another hospital visit to and they finally come home and they started doing something. I mean, it was such a depressing day for them and it was all full of potential immediate and, and immediate losses that when they got home, they 
they had a habit, they, they established a habit of telling each other yeah, three things that went right during the day. Mm-hmm. And one day they got home from visiting the dying mother and, and whatever else had gone wrong with members of their family and they got home and they sat there in silence and one of them said, you know, the nurse that was taking care of my mother, she actually smiled a couple of times today. Hmm. Well, let's see. What can the other person say? Well, let's see. I saw my mother smile. I really did. She smiled today. She woke up and smiled and then went back to sleep. And so they dug around and they finally found one of them said, you know, the doctor walked in the room and he smiled too. Gee, that was good. Those were gifts for today. Sometimes you don't get very much. And you really got to value what positives there might be. But even to look at three things that you might consider minor or not important. I mean, it kind of paves the way for tomorrow. Maybe tomorrow there will be more pluses. You know, life is full of negatives, but it's full of positives, too. And even looking back from a later stage of life, you look at some of the... I know a lot of people look at how I would have changed my life if I had a choice. But a lot of people look at their lives and say, well, I chose this path. And here are the positives that came out of it. You know, there are pluses in every experience, Mm -hmm. even if it's full of minuses. You follow what I'm saying? And I think you're responding to the um, a few questions that have come up that that really are that that you're addressing. So I don't even have to read you the questions, but it's how do you sort of change losses into and reframe it into something more uplifting? And I think you're speaking well, you about that of trying to actually focus reframe on it. That. Yeah, you, right. You know, you it right. doesn't take the losses away. Right. It just changes the focus so that it's like it's like a coffee that you don't want to drink because it's black and it's <laughs> and it's too strong it's too old sitting there so you you put some milk in it or some cream in it or a little sugar in it <laughs> and that's what i'm talking about putting into your view mhm a little sugar or a little yeah. cream it's a nice way to look at it, yeah. So I have a, 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 some other questions I want to integrate. So Linda from Longboat Key says or asks, do you advise planning and taking steps in advance toward moving to accommodate for the potential changes of aging? She has an example that, you know, her significant other turned 85 and she's 79 and he has back issues and walks slower, but still able to live a vital life. And they've begun wondering if it's, if it, there would be wisdom in looking to move into a retirement community in time that they don't really want to do it now, but sort of wonders because she had been married previously and, you know, realized although her husband had died from Parkinson's disease, they were able to live in the current home. But, you know, she was aware that, you know, had he lived longer, given the disabilities, they probably wouldn't have been able to live there. So back to the beginning part. I mean, what what advice do you have about planning and taking steps in advance? I mean, I can't, I can't give advice that covers everyone's situation. Sure. But I can tell you this. It's easier, a lot easier to make changes when you are able to make choices. When you've 
just falling down the stairs and you live alone and you all of a sudden can't live alone again. I mean, do you have to move? Do you have to get out of your house? Where is your family living? Do you have to have some hire somebody to be there all the time? I mean, every situation is different. But there you're in a situation where something has to be done immediately. Two, nine, five, oh, I'm five, sorry four, about that. Five, <laughs> but um, if if you can make changes in advance, sensible changes, you have all different choices. I mean, if you're going to move to a retirement community, but you're going to put it off until you have to then you may have to make a choice because you're in the hospital with a broken something or other and your kids are going to make the choice for you because they'll make it on their own terms. Whatever they feel they can afford, whatever location makes the most sense to to the majority of the kids and the family. or But your input isn't available then at that time because you're in a life death situation. I mean, you've got to, you're under doctor's care. So I guess what I'm, I'm really saying because every situation is, is different, very different from another's, but there's going to be changes in your life. And if you think ahead that to that realistically, you have many more, much more control over making those changes before they're necessary. See, it depends on whether you live with a husband or a partner, or if you live in a neighborhood where you're close with everybody. I mean, everything, everyone's situation is different. And I think that Learning to look at the changes in your life, in your health, in your age, in your stage of life, and thinking ahead to the possible changes that might be necessary. Maybe you can come to some point in your life where you can make the changes before the necessity involves an immediate, quick change without your choice. Now, I'm not even going to give an example because there's a million different examples. Right, right. I mean, no, I think what you've said is, I mean, I think you've... I'm sorry? A, a, I think what you've offered in this, I mean, it's, I think it's a wonderful bit of advice to try to, to, and to, try to think and, and make some accommodations when you can make choices, but but that it really does vary from person to person of to what, ex, you know, how dramatic the changes have to be, I guess. Yes, um, but also it matters right. who you're living with and if you're and married what, and yep. what their what limitations are or, or what yep. their wishes are. But right. you have to be sensible about it. And being sensible about it means knowing that in your later life, in your late 70s, even if there hasn't been a big change yet, that there's going to be some changes. Mm-hmm. And maybe maybe you could make your life easier now if you went around and looked at different options for your mm-hmm. situation and maybe got rid of the house you live in because it's got an upstairs and a basement. And maybe if you did that before it was necessary, Mm. maybe if you got comfortable in a different situation, then maybe you could look back and say, I'm glad I did that and took care of all that stuff before I had to. Mm. You know, this idea that well, that's somebody else's problem, and mine's going to be different. Well, yeah, yours will be different. 
but you also might have to make i mean i I now live in a house that has no basement, and I live in a community where everybody pays to have the the lawn taken care of, and you know a lot of things done. I mean, and a lot of things I have to take care of myself, and so I've found the people I can hire to do because I can't do them anymore. I mean, I'm not changing storm windows these days. I can lift a couple of dishes, but not a storm window. (laughs) And if you accept the limitations that come and make preparations for some in advance, it makes life so much easier. Then you can focus on what you can do and enjoy the day, or enjoy part of it anyway. Mm-hmm. And if you live in a situation where you can sneak in a nap every day, <laughs> well, even if you're active and busy, but when you realize that that nap makes a difference, then you make space for it in your day. <laughs> I mean, it's about accommodating realistically some of the changes in your energy, your health, your family, your obligations. You know, some of us have have to learn how to say, no, I can't do that. Mm-hmm. We've gone through our life where we said yes to everything. Yeah, I can do that. Sure. Sure, I'll do that. Mm-hmm. Well... Maybe now you have to, before you open your mouth, say, you know, I I wish I could say yes, but I know I can't take that on for you. But maybe I can help you find someone. I mean, that's a lot different than saying yes to something that's going to stretch you beyond where you know you should be stretched. Mm -hmm. Mm Mm-hmm. You have to really accept the changes in your energy and and in in your needs. And I'll tell you, those changes can come very quickly in the later years. And there, and now there are many of us living until a long time. And I, I want to tell you, there's there's a difference between eighty two. And 83 often, just that fast. I mean, you don't think of that when you're 50 and then you're going to be 52. The changes aren't that dramatic. But they can be very, very dramatic in the later years. And you wake up one morning and things can be very different. And you have to realize that that attitude of, I can do it, I can do it, I've always done it, I'm going to do it, isn't a terribly healthy decision at some times in your life. Mm. I think I you're so right. I and I just, You have to yeah. really assess what you're... 75th year is like over what your 79th year is like or how the 81st year is different and accept Mm -hmm. those changes and challenges. I want to comment that Linda, who wrote the other question, said, I just want to say I think the response from Connie seems right on. Thank you. Not easy to make changes before we really feel ready, but options is significant. So... I think well, it sure makes the difference when you can yeah. consider your different options or if you have to make a right. change by two, two in the afternoon, you know, or the same day. Right. That's a different right. world. Right. I have another question for you. It's a slight variation on some of these other questions, and then we'll come back, although I want to be aware of the okay. time. But Don from Ontario Canada asks and wonders, did you experience, did your experience as a broadcaster sharpen your curiosity and sustain your zest for life? And he sort of wonders about suggestions you may have for seniors who do freelance writing on how to kind of 
work in this world with media now, but but I think the first part of the question about, I mean, do you think some of your own experience sharpened your curiosity and your zest for life, well, or do you think it was other? other I've parts? always had a lot of curiosity. That's what started me exploring mm-hmm. other people's stories. Mm-hmm. But I think I think this myth that we have in this culture of I mean, it still hangs over. Oh, you're too old to learn. Or those days are over. Mm-hmm. They aren't. I mean, you can still learn by reading an article in a magazine. You can learn somebody else's point of view of something. I mean, if you if you keep open to... If you keep open mm-hmm. to the changes in the world, even if your world is small, I mean, my world is much smaller than it once was. But there are things to learn in that smaller world. Mm-hmm. And there are things to learn that make my life more satisfying. And things to learn that can make it more easily manageable. My friends and I very often joke. Oh, I spend the whole day walking around the house to remember where I to remember where I put X Y Z. Now, <laughs> you you can do that. I mean, but you can also find a way of maybe labeling things or putting. All things of one kind in one place. Maybe even putting a sign up somewhere for yourself. It depends on what your your current limitations are and and how they're getting in your way. And finding a solution for yourself. And you, you can unlearn old habits and establish some new ones. And it makes your life. I mean, if you're if you're living alone, it makes it a lot easier. It, you don't have a friend to say, where do you think the X, Y, Z is? But if you got notes around and you keep putting things in the same place, you can learn these things and make things much more manageable for yourself. I'm not just saying this. I mean, I'm pushing 85. And I practice these things. I can tell you that there are ways to get around your own, excuse the expression, I don't like to use it too often, but your own disabilities and losses. Yes, every time I get in the car, I have to go back twice because I forgot my X or my Y or my Z, okay? But okay, you leave enough time so you can go back in the house and and get the package you forgot or the list that you wrote and of of what you you're going to pick up. And I'll tell you another trick too. If you remember the neighborhood well enough, the best thing that you can do is write in order of where you're going to make the stops. Hmm. So that you don't get all the way halfway into 20 miles in and then realize that you didn't pick up whatever it was that was right near your house. But if you can remember the order of what you're going to pick up or drop off and you have a list written large, by the way, because you're not going to squint when you're driving, so it's got to be large. And and you do things in order. You you can get things done as efficiently as you once did, if you can think them through ahead of time. But look, everybody's situation is different. Everybody's challenges are different. I mean, I so often you read five five suggestions for dealing with forgetting or 10 suggestions on how to remember what you got what where you're going and how to get there you have to figure out your own way that works 
I mean, you got to watch the, if you're driving, you have to watch the road. And so if you're going to have written directions to a place that you're not sure how you're going, you better have either have them recorded or on a program that will speak to you or else the writing has to be really huge so you can quickly glance at it and you know that you're going to make a left turn at at the corner of you know Cleveland and uh, whatever so that you stay on the right side of the room the right side of the road right. to make a right turn. If you get to a point where these things are impossible and even a recording doesn't help, then maybe you can't drive too far anymore. I haven't found that from myself yet, but I can also tell you that I realize that the traffic is not what it used to be. That the hours that I have to drive certain places, I can't do anymore unless I want to be stuck bumper to bumper for a long time. And so my days are, have changed around and yours will too. And I can only suggest that when traffic patterns change, when things change in your neighborhood, change your schedule so that what you have to do, go out and do, you are able to do at the easiest times for your traveling and for yourself. Things change quickly, and changes in weather change everything. And so I can only tell you that <laughs> things take longer <laughs> for us older people. <laughs> So we have plenty yeah. of time. Better to be think, early. Yeah. Better yeah. to be early. So much of what you're saying, Connie, is and, and, and what is so important, part of what I said at the beginning about being the role model, too, is, you know, really helping all of us think about, as you're experiencing yourself, that, you know, life changes, our bodies change, our relationships change as people, you know, as we and or people that we love get ill and 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 die and and that the, you know how important it is to accommodate to all of that and to continue to have connections and relationships and movement and you know meaning in your life we, we didn't really get to that part but it, and I'd love it if you could share a little of just because I know one of your books is Late Life Loves and you know that it, how important it is to just connect with people you know, perhaps developing relationships yeah. well, or that, friendships. And... Yeah. That book, the subtitle is Romance and New Relationships in Later Years. Mm -hmm. But I think the new relationships is minimized in this book because it is about new love relationships and people mm -hmm. sharing just with one person special. But also, you need to have relationships in your life. Mm -hmm. Isolation isolation is a dangerous thing. And a lot of people are isolated because they live on the third floor and they can't walk the stairs anymore. And I, I know that the solutions for that, I mean, certainly one of the solutions is to live in a different space. But, you know, some solutions cost a lot of money, and they're not available to everybody. If you have money, you can solve your problem a lot quicker. But to have to set up a schedule through some organization that would send you a visitor every day if you're on a third floor and you can't walk the stairs anymore that can make an awful lot of difference in your life. I mean, it might be your church. It might be a community center. It might be a senior service. You might have to have one of your kids or neighbors set it up for you. But isolation in the later years is a dangerous disease, believe me. 
and you have to put your effort into it or have somebody in your family really help you get that set up. It's very, it's vital. I mean, I'm not even going to say very important. It's vital. Isolation is the worst disease that you can have in the later years. And, of course, everybody's solution is different. Everybody's family looks at it differently. Some people don't have family. So they are reliant on whatever services there are in the community. And hopefully, if they're living in isolation, hopefully they've made a, an attempt to, to move out of that situation in spite of the fact that I've always lived on this farm and I love it here and I'm going to live here forever and die here. Well, fine, if you can have help come in twice a day or somebody come and stay with you every night. But let's be real. It's hard to be real because what it means is what was real isn't real anymore. Mm I think that sounds like Amen. a... Amen. I don't know what else yeah, to Yeah, no, that's a good place to... No, I, I think that's a, a good final takeaway. I mean, what you've been sharing is sort of being realistic and being uh, being realistic and making adjustments and and still keeping that curiosity and zest for life and but being real and things change fast i mean i really think that's an important takeaway and you know and that we're not invulnerable and that you know hopefully we we're, we're going to have you know all of us have years ahead but what the quality will be in terms of what we can do just in terms of our own physicality and or people that we love and are with who may need modifications and to be realistic about it. I think, I mean, I just am hearing that over and over and and also the gift of connecting with people and being part of each other's lives and not being isolated. I mean, I think, you know, and, and meaningful connections. and every Every community has certain services that could be available. Most right. churches offer certain connections. You, you really right. need someone to help you reach out. Yeah. They don't come to you yeah. unless you go out and seek them. Reach out and find them, yeah. Connie, thank you so much for spending this time with us and sharing your wisdom and some of the stories. And, you know, just the, the as you say, let's be real. Aging happens, and you are a model of sort of some of the accommodations we have to make and, and, and not sort of putting our head in the sand like the ostrich and sort of pretending it's not going to happen to us, but to be realistic that changes do happen and we need to... And they often happen you know, very quickly. Right. Thank you so much, you know, for joining us today and being on the call. I want to thank everybody for being part of the call. Connie, thank well, I thank you for the opportunity to talk to all those people that I can't see. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thanks for it's sharing. It's like the old experience. days of radio. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> well, take care and thank you, everybody. You've been listening to Revolutionize Your Retirement Radio with Dr. Dorian Mincer. To learn more about the resources mentioned on today's show, listen to past episodes, or download our free retirement transition guide, visit revolutionizeyourretirementradio.com.